Antonio Sorrentino. Um, I come from Italy and work here in Germany as a research scientist. And I uh, decided to take part to this initiative to um, of reading of books um, that were burned um, by the Nazi in 1933. And the book that I choose to read is uh, Martin Eden, written by Jack London. This is a, a semi-autobiographical book, and uh, I choose it because um, it's, uh, one of the topics is the difference of point of view uh, between the different social classes back then and uh, today as well. Uh, specifically, the, the chapter um, which I'm going uh, to read in the, um, Martin Eden, um, uh, struggle um, in his style to um, um, struggle to read uh, some books in his studying, and uh, this ongoing process in this ongoing process he starts to develop uh, uh, critical thinking, and this is actually critical thinking is what uh, uh, Nazis wanted to suppress um, uh, by burning several books in 1933. Having uh, uh, no new companions, nothing remained for him but to read, and the long hours he devoted to it would have ruined a dozen pairs of ordinary eyes, but his eyes were strong, and they were backed by a body superbly strong. It seemed to him by the end of the week that he had lived centuries so far behind where the old life and outlook. but. He was baffled by lack of preparation. He attempted to read books that required years of preliminary specialization. One day he would read a book of antiquated philosophy, and the next day one that was ultramodern, so that his head would be whirling with the conflict and contradiction of ideas. It was the same uh, with the economists. On the one shelf at the library he found the card marks Ricardo, Adam, Smith, and, and me. And the abstruse formulas of the one gave no clue that the ideas of another were obsolete. He was bewildered, and yet he wanted to know. He had become interested in a day in economics, industry, and politics. Passing through the city hall park, he had noticed a group of men in center of which were half a dozen with flushed faces and raised voices, earnestly carrying on a discussion. He joined listeners and heard a new alien tongue in the mouths of the philosophers of the people. One was a Trump, another was a labor agitator, a third was a law school student, and the remainder was composed of worthy working men. For the first time, he heard of socialism, anarchism, and single tax, and learned that uh, um, there were whirling social philosophies. He heard hundreds of technical words that were new to him, belonging to fields of thought that his major reading had never touched upon. Because of this, he could not follow the arguments closely, and he could only guess at and at. Um, and sur surmise the idea wrapped up in such strange expressions. Martin Eden said was in a state of adamant when he went away after several hours, and he hurried to the library to look up the definition of dozen unusual words. And when he left the library, he carried under his arms four volumes. Madame Blavatsky, Secret of Three, Progress and Purity, the quintessence of socialism, and the warfare of religion and science. Unfortunately, he began on the secret doctrine. Every line bristled with many syllabled words he did not understand. He sat up in a bed, and the dictionary was in front of him more often than the book. He looked up so many new words that when they recurred, he had forgotten their meaning and had to look them up again. He devised the plan of writing the definitions in a notebook and filled page after page with them. And still he could not understand. He read until three in the morning and his brain was in a turmoil, but no one essential thought in the, in the text had he grasped. He looked up and it seemed that the room was lifting 
healing and plunging like a sheep upon the sea. Then he heard the, the secret doctrine, and many curses across the room turned off the gas and composed himself to sleep. Nor did he have much better luck with the other three books. It was not that his brain was weak or incapable. It could think these thoughts were it uh, not for a lack of training in thinking and lack of thought tools with which to think. He guessed this and for a while entertained the idea of reading nothing but the dictionary until he had mastered every word in it. Poetry, however, was his solace and he read much of it finding his greatest joy in the simple poets who were more understandable. He loved beauty, and there he found beauty. Poetry, like music, stirred him profoundly, and thought he did not know it, he was preparing his mind for the heavier work that was to come.